diving into DeFi today as we look a little bit deeper on some of the projects that are really starting to change the game. As you guys know, we do a lot of analysis and CEO interviews today. Today's no different. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to Tech Path. Today we're joining us is John Wu from Ava Labs, who is, of course, you know, Avalanche. You kind of get it. John, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, Paul, it's a pleasure to be here. And I always love watching your stuff because you have a great way of putting together your personal experience back in the day with analyzing current modern day technology, whether it be blockchain or AI or anything else. It's fun, you know, I look at it this way, tech never changes, it's just the game and the software. That's all it is, the mission, the passion, all those things, the program leads, you, you name it, you just put one set in in the 1990s, one set in the 2000s, one set in the 2020s. It's pretty much the same thing. You just give them different tools to play with, which is kind of fun to, to see the evolution of where technology has moved for sure. Let's talk, when I say welcome you back, what I'm saying is we've talked about Avalanche on our show before. Uh, we really like the project, kind of fascinated with what is going on uh, there with you guys. Give our audience an insight of where Avalanche is going, kind of the Ava Labs program, a little bit more about it. Absolutely. So I'm president of Ava Labs. It's the team behind Avalanche, the protocol. Avalanche, the protocol is a first layer protocol. It is out there. It is similar to Ethereum, where there's a lot yep. of DeFi projects and other utility being built on top of it. Avalanche has only been on the mainnet for about eight months. Um, for that amount of time, we've had a lot of organic interest because we have certain features I think that's been very appealing to Solidity and to developers in the blockchain right. crypto space in general. That is very fast transaction uh, processing speeds. We're talking about TPSs of 6,000, similar to that of Visa on a normal day. Um, the security is incredible with decentralization of over a thousand uh, validators now. And also, frankly, uh, the gas prices are very, very low. So. The project was born out of Cornell University, the founder, Eamon Gunseer. He's a well-known, call him an OG in the space, and he and his PhD students realized certain things that needed to improve in the first layer protocol space in order to ultimately be a digitized, tokenized future. Our mission is really to digitize or, or help digitize or tokenize the $700 trillion worth of financial assets and assets that are out there in the world today. In the near term, our goal is to make our DeFi experience for Avalanche, the protocol, the best it can be out there. All right, so uh, a little bit to unpack here. When you look at you know, decentralized finance, and kind of the evolution of where the payment systems are going. It's one of, I've just read an article where many of our world's best and most renowned experts in terms of cyber terrorism are looking at our payment architectures as probably our weakest link or one of our weakest links in terms of the US, North America, modern Western world countries, including the UK, et cetera. When you look at, at because I'm always worried about grid and you know all we've seen with these things around ransomware and, and so on, really kind of invading a, a bit of modern day society. Payment systems have not necessarily been looked at. If you look at DeFi and really the future of payment systems, whether it's Visa, MasterCard, all the big guys who you know, have some pretty decent transaction speeds, but even at the current rate of growth, we've seen a little bit of pressure on those networks, even the ones that are most seasoned just because of the shift to online, especially around food and retail goods and services, et cetera. How quickly could an avalanche come in and actually give us a real alternative in DeFi for a payment tr transaction architecture to actually go live into the banking system and maybe into restaurant or, or into you know businesses, restaurants, all those kinds of things? Well, settlement is actually payment in the blockchain, and that's part of the benefit going forward. And that's why in the financial services area, a lot of people are thinking of how fast the payment system and the rails can be. Because if it right. is done that way, look at equities. There's T plus two it used to be T plus three. You can unlock a lot of trap capital. And then that will, in theory, give you better IRR because you don't have to mm -hmm. tie up your capital. But the question as to how soon 
the financial services industry and who is out there that can help part of the benefit of DeFi. The, the settlement and payment system is just part of the benefit of DeFi. DeFi's ultimate goal is to, in a P2P manner, replace the existing rails that allow people not just for settlement and payment, but also transacting and exchanging of financial assets in a regulatory compliant way. So right now in private blockchains, you are already seeing countries as well as companies yeah. use the blockchain to experiment with a more efficient way. So ultimately, I think the dream is the permissionless, which is what Avalanche, the protocol focuses on. Someday, yes, I really believe it's not that far away, you're gonna see a world where that 2% that you pay when you go to Starbucks and Starbucks takes away or doesn't get paid, the merchant doesn't get a hundred dollar purchase, the merchant doesn't get a hundred, they get 98. And that $2 should shrink, shrink because there's just a lot of intermediaries serving good purposes right now, taking a piece of that. And that will ultimately come down. I think we are approaching that world faster in the private blockchain where there's closed loop systems. People are working on that as we speak. But someday, I'm talking five years from now, the permissionless world will allow that as well. And I know that because the difference between the Avalanche uh, protocol and some of the others is you can do both. The ability to create sub networks or private blockchains on the Avalanche protocol allows enterprises to choose their own validators, their own governance, and take advantage of the automated workflow as well as the seamless transfer of assets in a faster way. And then one day they can, it's almost like an open API, they can, they can take the key, turn it, and then um, be part of a permissionless network. So, okay, so when you look at the infrastructure that we currently have in place, it's taken pretty much five decades to build it the banking systems, the SWIFT network, you know, all of the financial instruments we have in place that really kind of help the globe and the world transact. The potential here for blockchain is to supplant and or potentially just come in and reset that, that bar in terms of capabilities, security, the, the concern about hacking and, and, you know, the ransomware scenarios almost fade to black. In, in, in the perfect world, if you listen to Cardano and what Hoskins says about really where the ultimate you know, utopia is for, for, for blockchain. How, do you think these banks and all these platforms are just gonna walk away from this? I just feel like either one, they have to adopt it or somehow engage in the blockchain to a certain level. What is gonna stop the infrastructure that is in place today from maybe just switching to a, a blockchain platform? It's, it's clear that uh, the new generation of fintech, they, or we'll call it the banks themselves, they are not sitting idle. They've seen what happened with the e-commerce retail world. They've seen what happened with other industries that technology has disrupted. There are, the, the banks, the financial services firms, they are all very active in experimenting and future-proofing themselves. But the issue with banks, as you know, Paul, from dealing with large behemoths, is that they are regulated and they cannot do all the things that they would like to do. So maybe the answer will be they research internally on what they can do, and then there will be tucked in acquisitions over time and they can proxy a good solution. They are not uh, oblivious to what is happening out there like previous industries when first when tech first attacked it. And it's not a surprise that uh, financial services and the uh, healthcare industries are the last ones that Silicon Valley has come after, primarily because mm -hmm. these are the hardest and most regulated places. All right, so I see a lot of these moves happening around us literally as we're talking today. You've got El Salvador making moves, other potential countries in uh, South America that are already in consideration of potentially moving to blockchain and or Bitcoin. And scenarios like that, I mean, you saw a strike that I thought was a very interesting uh, strategy of, of getting the unbanked in El Salvador into a position. So uh, with what Mahler's is doing over there, do you see this, especially around the banking 
let's go now not to the unbanked, but to the banked, because this is going to be essentially replacing a lot of the known payment architectures that we have today. Zelle, Venmo, you name it. Even maybe, you know, I, of course, I understand, you know, Square and PayPal, very ex they're very accelerated in this. But do you see projects like Avalanche and Ava Labs moving quickly into that space, or is this specific for more of the more enterprise architecture? So for Avalanche, I will talk about Avalanche because Avalanche knows Avalanche the best. The ability of the underlying platform can, and therefore Ava Labs, the company supporting Avalanche, has actually talked to many enterprises. The, uh, the fact that enterprises like a PayPal Square that you mentioned earlier, they are creating, especially, and you mentioned Venmo. So Venmo is owned by PayPal. And what right. PayPal does better than anyone is abstract away the crypto layer from their users. I mean, I think they have 29 million merchants on one side and close to over 300 million wallets on the other side. So they've aggregated this great marketplace of users for payments. But what they're doing is making sure that experience for transferring cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum around is as seamless as if they were in Venmo moving dollars around. However, mm -hmm. they are talking to many blockchain players and they are also talking to and buying companies. And underneath yep. the hood is actually quite messy. Um, it is above the surface for the user. These enablers have done a great job of extract, abstracting that away. So back to your question in terms of Avalanche and its process in helping financial services adopt payment rails. That is one of the applications that the Avalanche protocol can do. But I also think that each different type of blockchain will focus on a certain functionality. Avalanche's platform is more focused on tokenizing and digitizing assets, real estate in the future. So much of real estate is held in places where only the big boys can play. But once mm -hmm. there is possibly better regulation around how that can be fractionalized and how that can be tokenized or the right of ownership can be transferred in a seamless manner to a token or digital way, you're going to need basically functionality and allowing that exchange of that fractionalized piece of real estate and making sure yeah. that it's compliant and it can transfer seamlessly. John, have you seen any movement in, maybe this is something that Ava is doing that I'm not aware of, but any movement in where tokenization of businesses and or potential, like if you look at the startup and you've been in the VC world and you've seen the startup world from the Silicon Valley phase, I've lived through that, I've been around all that uh, my whole life. And one of the biggest problems and challenges for a startup back in the 90s, 2000s, early 2000s, there just weren't a lot of structured capital out there for some of these amazing projects. No, today that's a different story over the past five years. But I, I can't imagine that this is not going to jump to the blockchain. I know Andreessen Horowitz is, is involved with you guys. Do you see the VCs understanding where blockchain is going in terms of tokenization of these startups to be able to give them lifeblood and get them off the ground? Yes, the VCs know, well, certain VCs, I should say, are mm -hmm. very familiar with what's happening. In fact, yeah. The, the funny thing about um, the blockchain and crypto uh, first layer coins, as well as others out there, is that it has the potential to basically upend the entire uh, market for how business is being done. And right. I'll take it from the enterprise side and then the venture capital side. So from the, from the business side, you know, I was a tech investor at some well-known funds, and we spent a lot of time trying to find companies that can scale and have network effects and where margins can be so low, you know, low capex intensive companies that can have ridiculously high margins, sometimes hopefully, you know, 75% gross margins and then EBITDA margins of 40%. And that's the kind of company you long for. And if you could find that combined with a lot of um, network effects, then you found yourself a potentially a great investment, and hopefully you did it early when they still had negative EBITDA. So yeah. how does that translate here in the blockchain world? Well, you mentioned Mark Andreessen. He mentioned that software will eat the world, and yep. that has been happening. So a lot of these new SaaS companies, they've now automated workflow, 
and removed intermediaries uh, and humans actually from jobs. So therefore it's become a better margin. Like my company, Ava Labs, the, probably the number one um, uh, tax expenditure out there is still people. So not to be so um, negative on human capability, but if you think about what blockchain can do if, it, if done right, it is literally reinventing a whole new way of business that can be done. The OPEX that has to be spent can be shrunk even further because now yeah. you're not just creating software, but you're programming business logic into the actual smart contract. You're removing even more layers. And this is what we talked about in terms of DeFi. You have DeFi projects out there, whether it's the lending space or in the call it exchange, decentralized exchange space, where you're seeing so much volume created by literally 10 to 15 people in a company. Even mm -hmm. CeFi crypto companies like Coinbase would be jealous. Coinbase took eight years plus, I think, to, to become what it is. 3,000 um, people in the firm. And suddenly you have all of these AMMs that have popped up within the last year and a half. And although obviously yep. the volume is not the same, suddenly you have on a time adjusted perspective, you have these incredible companies that's creating an immense amount of value with literally, you know, not uh, one one hundredth of the manpower as you basically take the logic, the business logic and put it into the smart contract. It's software eating the world to another level. Yeah, I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is the the shift that is occurring in in blockchain tech that is adapting to all sorts of I, I wouldn't call them necessarily challenges that we knew were challenges, but they were definitely uh, rub points within growth and innovation, especially in VC. You know, in the VC world, it was always growth and innovation was was stifled based on your your access to low co low cost capital. That's that's really what it boils down to. Nobody could compete with Amazon at you know the kind of capital that these guys have access to, or or any of the SoftBank you know troughs that are out there that they have access to in terms of funding. So being able to go, get to that level on tokenization and moving into more of the smarter VC firms that are kind of moving in this direction, this is going to be pretty fascinating to watch, especially around the innovation side. I could see this could cut loose some really, the next era of unicorns coming our way, for sure. Any that you're watching right now? There's, there's so to, to finish that point, um, <laughs> And this is very interesting you brought that up. You remember back in the old days where Cisco's venture arm was uh, revered as being great and other Intel's venture right. arm and other in, you know, venture arms inside of various companies. Now yeah. you have these blockchains, these you know, protocols that have the ability to aggregate a community and the community can, can be very passionate about certain applications and they are the ones that are effectively the new venture arm. It can, right. so instead, if you're an DAP developer and you have a great idea, idea you may actually not go to XYZ venture mm -hmm. company. You may want to go directly to the protocol like Avalanche, and then Avalanche can give you not only integration help into the protocol, but also give you marketing support to tap into that community, give you you know, business development support. So one of the things, a simple example would be security audits. Right now, there's basically too many projects and too long a line, a pipeline for the number right. of small number of reputable security audit firms. So if you have, you know, a mass level of help from one protocol, maybe you have a good relationship with uh, a better relationship, an intro to a security audit firm and you can launch your thing faster. So it's becoming for, um, certain protocols, it's relationship capital to the ultimate extent, accelerating the, the project as well as incubating it, not just transactional. Well, I think this is why we've, we, you know, we study coins and projects and tokens and all this, all this on a day in day out basis. One thing that's fascinating to me is the amount of projects that start to migrate into certain areas. And there's a handful of them, especially in the DeFi space, you guys being one of them, that really kind of start to group together like-minded projects that really kind of amplify, lift the all boats 
uh, so to speak, which I think is going to be a huge thing in terms of being able to, like you said, you know, MVP, you know, you got, you got to get to a viable product quickly. You've got to get to a level to where you can get past all these, you know, these thresholds that you've got to cross to get out there into the open public and start doing the project you wanted to get launched with. So that's going to be fun to watch. I want to go direction on DeFi and really stay in um, kind of the the Ethereum side of, of blockchain development and what we've seen, whether it's ERC-20 or some of those projects. Do you see other projects, especially you mentioned this just a minute ago that I thought was interesting, and that is the ability of these projects to scale uh, fairly low cost, be able to get to you know a, a tremendous, especially in profitability. There's a few projects that we've started to watch that are kind of going in that direction that are completely away from the DeFi space, but they're definitely uh, moving in into blockchain and, and kind of accumulating, which eventually at some point they get so big, they're going to plug into DeFi for some sort of financial transaction at some point. How big do you think that side, because that's an area of the blockchain that I don't think a lot of people, more of the apps side of things, if you look like Audius and some of those projects that are kind of moving in that direction, what do you think the future of that is for companies? So the the app side, so there are certain, for DeFi in specific, there are certain pieces of the DeFi infrastructure that are absolutely requirements for these dApps, if you will. First, right. you know, there's the exchange, there's the AMMs. Then there's, mm -hmm. well, just infrastructure itself, there's stable coins, you need stable coins, you need some sort of collateral yep. to help uh, any financial ecosystem move smoothly. You need lending and borrowing capability. You need yield aggregation, uh, you need asset managers, you need leverage in the system. You need all of these uh, different pieces that exist in the traditional financial services ecosystem that we all take for granted. So the dApps that we are seeing, um, and they are all doing great things. They're all trying to create a community around them. The hardest thing I think for all of these dApps is that they are right now using, think of it as the old internet days where these companies in e-commerce were relied on the funding from the capital markets, whether it's public or private, in order to acquire customers with huge discounts or incentives. A lot of these dApps are doing similar things. So what the hope in the internet companies, whether it was a search engine or a um, uh, e-commerce company, they were hoping that there would be enough players using their service with a brand that there will be leverage in their call it marketplace. Right. That is similar with the DeFi projects. They are using the capital, frankly, low cost capital that's available out there to incentivize with discounts and other ways to draw customers yeah. in. So the customer acquisition is relatively easy to, um, to calculate. What is impossible mm -hmm. to calculate right now is the lifetime value of that customer because right. the switching costs for a lot of these customers is too easy. And they will go from project, sorry, go from project to project, from chain to chain based on where the best incentives are. It's kind of like, um, I remember when I was a young kid, you know, the banks were giving out toaster ovens or, tr or trips to, <laughs> to, and parents will run around and try to sign up five accounts. But in the end, like you, they only use one or two account where most right. of the money was. Yeah. But that is what's happening here. It's what happened in the 90s with, I remember friends of mine would go buy a bar of soap from some e-commerce. And I'm sure it cost that e-commerce company far more than a $2 piece of soap and, and then bring it to you for like $3 or something. And basically you're getting soap for free and the delivery at your dorm room or whatever instantly. So there's a lot of money being spent at the capital markets, low cost of funding that's providing right now. Um, a little scary that we're using equity capital, equivalent of equity capital in order to do this. But we've seen this story before. I think you said it eloquently earlier. Um, the pictures, the faces, things change, but the frameworks, with which business revolves don't necessarily change that much. There are evolutionary aspects to right. it, but not revolutionary aspects. Yeah, it seems like the it's kind of going that direction. What I'm waiting for, and maybe you can answer this question, is because what I've seen so far in the DeFi space, and I haven't seen everything out there, but 
you know, I've lived through 20 years in Silicon Valley, global uh, software development, probably some of the best minds in the world working on projects. And, and I've seen some pretty crazy backroom, you know, tech, uh, <laughs> tech roadmaps that kind of surprise you even today would surprise me. Uh, but I haven't seen in the blockchain space that kind of breakout app or breakout project project that has just been one of those things that just becomes the new whatever. Is there any area within DeFi that you guys feel is really a big opportunity for Ava Labs or where Avalanche is going that maybe is something that, you know, it's out in left field where people aren't looking, you know, right now. Right. So I think that space, frankly, is still too nascent for an obvious Facebook like in social media. Now, right. I don't know if the dApps are still in Friendster or MySpace land, but you know, it will go through some iteration. And at some point, there will be one that has network effects and has aggregated better features and constantly innovating with new features and keep people there. Or the capital markets or the, you know, um, the crypto capital markets kind of shuts down and then someone's left there with all the users. So I think we're too early to see that one simple app that is right. obvious. For the ecosystems or the playgrounds underneath all these apps, think of them almost like you know iOS or Android or uh, Microsoft you know, operating systems. Those are are all also in a similar way trying to find that great killer, you know, DAP. And but while they're doing that, they need to also bring on as much of the players that are existing right now because we don't know who will be and no one really knows who will end up being Facebook. Facebook, if you remember, didn't know themselves. They were basically Zynga yep. until mobile accidentally happened for them. And then suddenly mm -hmm. they, they, they had liftoff velocity. But I'll share one thing that I think is very, very encouraging, which is I remember um, when I was in the tech investment world at, at some well-known hedge funds and talking to a lot of friends back in the 90s, they would do the math about, you know, streaming video and how that was absolutely impossible. Netflix right. would never be around if they just looked at the amount of bandwidth you needed, the amount of costs associated with it and the time and duration. It was kind of like, OK, if you want to download a movie, go to bed, down, start to download. And hopefully there's no interruptions in the morning. Luckily, you'll see it. If, if you're not lucky, you won't see it. They hadn't even thought about like streaming yet or mobile streaming. But what we did see back then and what we're seeing now is the amount of intellectual curiosity and the amount of talent coming out of the best schools into tech development and the internet back then and into the blockchain space today. Every single person I'm interviewing for Ava Labs is more effectively on paper, at least more qualified than the previous one based on that era of their life. So we are yeah. going to see a lot of brain power come to this space and help solve some of those. And you will see that great killer DAP. Yeah, for sure. Is there a particular uh, protocol or when you look at certain skill sets as you're building, you know, an infrastructure like Ava Labs and what AVAX is, is up to, What's, I mean, especially for these young programmers that are coming out of school, maybe they, they're getting into blockchain for the first time, trying to spin up a project or, or get into a project, maybe with one of the superstars. What are some of the tips you're giving these people as they come into well, the space? On the, uh, so most of the schools today have very good computer science programs as it relates to blockchain, not just from the mm -hmm. cryptography side or the, or right. the uh, technology architecture side, but also they combine economics and game the theory. So, you know, as we know, crypto is a combination of all that. So there are great, you know, economic programs out there that now are teaching some game theory associated for directly for, for blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So the schools themselves are getting far more active in giving the skills and teaching it to young kids. Now, in terms of development, and I think, you know, Avalanche is EVM compatible. And there are okay. certain, certain blockchains out there that are basically Ethereum compatible, and therefore developers can develop in Solidity and makes not only their life a lot easier, because that is the biggest one right now. You can, we can argue whether it's the best or not, similar to how, you know, 
Um, JavaScript was not the greatest, but somehow it just you know penetrated the whole world of developers and it's the one that everyone knew. So I think the advice for them is if they want to get into space on the dApp side and development side, learn Solidity. Yeah. Yeah, Solidity is, of course, I don't know. I get people out there, you know, will argue that point. <laughs> uh, and, and it's kind of interesting to see the kind of these factions starting to develop. Last question for you, and that is, uh, when you look at your project and what you guys are up to, is there anything that you feel needs to happen for Ava Labs, Avalanche to really kind of blow up to the next level? So for we- you guys, kind of the next step. We have always been um, technology led. We have great founding team members and Eamon Gunsira, the well-known distributed systems professor. Innovation and constantly innovating, creating new products, new features, making tokenization of assets easier, faster, and more efficient. So we have a few new feature layouts this summer, which is gonna actually improve things even more so. Mm. So I think what we need is constant innovation then the business development team will be out there recruiting, you know, for Avalanche the protocol projects with the right incentive program. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's going to be good. I think you're, you guys are onto something in terms of how the structure of the protocol works and what you guys are up to is definitely in the right vein of things, especially around uh, investment and kind of the future of where investment assets are moving, especially in real estate. And, and also some others. I think uh, the tokenization of business to me is still very fascinating and the opportunities that are going to lie there are going to be pretty interesting over the next few years, for sure. John Wu, great having you on the show today, man. It's been, uh, been awesome to watch uh, what you guys have been doing. So keep it up out there. Paul, thank you very much. I love this show and I'll keep watching. All right. Okay, you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Make sure and give us some stars. That's how we get feedback from you. If you are here on YouTube, make sure and subscribe right now. This is the best way you can help the channel. And of course, uh, the number one way you can help us accelerate up to 100,000 subs, which has been a big move uh, for TechPath. Uh, if you guys are going out there, thanks to the Tech Tribe, uh, you guys have been doing fantastic. Last thing too, if you have an idea for a show or you want someone like John to come on as an interview, send us a note, which is just producer at revernetworks.com or hit me up on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.